This is Mondo Gonzalez and I'm here from Prophecy Watchers, but I wanted to give you a heads up on a, a recent talk that Billy Crone gave at his church this last week. And Billy Crone, as many of you know, has been a guest here at, at our studios uh, quite a bit. He's written a lot of good stuff and the latest um, message that he gave to his church was really concerning all the various things that we're seeing in the news right now. Certainly the deception that has been happening uh, in the mainstream media. He also spends a, a good amount of time discussing uh, the nature of the Ezekiel 38-39 war, which certainly we've spent a lot of time discussing as well. But uh, we thought that this message was so good that we wanted to bring it to you here on our channel. And also to remind you that Billy is going to be one of the speakers at our upcoming Homeward Bound conference in May. So with all that's going on in the world, there's no doubt uh, a lot is happening, again, day by day by day. Um, we're seeing the, the challenges of getting good information, but again, once again, this video is incredible. It'll be an encouragement to you. It'll point you once again, as always, to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have. So, enjoy. Hey, that's right. How long? Three weeks. That's right, Pastor Bobby. Three weeks. Pastor Tom Hughes is going to be here from Hope for Our Times Ministry. Lord willing, preaching for us. I uh, was just at a conference with him last weekend uh, with Pastor Brandon. And uh, so we had a great time there. But he is looking forward to being back here in Vegas. He loves it up here for some strange reason. And you guys must have paid him a bunch of money or something, slipped him some 50s or something. I don't know. But anyway, no, he's looking forward to being back here uh, in three weeks. So keep that in mind. Great opportunity to invite your friends, family. Once again, those people you find straggling on the street. Bring them in anyway. That's right. But not only that, hey, speaking of uh, Pastor Tom Hughes, Hope for Our Times Ministry, if you're familiar with his ministry, you're familiar with this guest. He'll be speaking here in Lordville on April 24th, Olivier Melnick. He's going to be giving us an update on Israel. Obviously, a Jewish man who's come to Christ as his Savior. He's got a firsthand scoop on what's going on over there. And uh, he's going to be here from Chosen People Ministries and a great guy. And uh, you'll find out he's a lover of cheese. Oh, yeah. But uh, no, he's going to be here, Lord willing, April 24th. But hey, we're not only welcome you're here, we're welcome uh, a part of our online family. Hey, speaking of which, our online family, uh, if you're interested in becoming a member at Sunrise Bible Church, if you're outside of Vegas, shoot us an email at membership at getalifemedia.net. Pastor Bobby will take you through Zoom classes, get you equipped uh, on doctrine, and, uh, and get you connected here at Sunrise. So if you're interested in that, do that. Also, even here locally, if you have a prayer request, I'm telling you, or our online family, one of the fastest ways to get your prayer request to our prayer team, right there. Prayer at getalifemedia.net. And that goes directly to our prayer team. Also, internship ministry. Basically, we're now doing Bible college all the way up to doctoral level here at Sunrise, Monday evenings. Uh, our first round of students, well, like 18 or something we started with, uh, is already full, but we're looking at a round two. So if you're interested in that here locally, then uh, see Pastor Bobby again after service. He'll get you hooked up on that. And then, uh, or if you're from afar, if you consider relocation, uh, send us an email internship at getalifemedia.net. Speaking of which, uh, we want to encourage you, our online audience, if you're watching online, we're doing it in seven different uh, channels now currently. Uh, three different channels on YouTube. Just search for my name, Billy Crone. You'll get hooked up. Subscribe in case they hack one off, which could happen uh, even after today. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so, uh, or three on Facebook. We got three accounts there. We're broadcasting live, or one on Twitter, and so we're doing that as well. But uh, if you're missing something, where do you go? Media.com. Getalifemedia.com is the teaching website. There you can get the DVDs, all the stuff that they've been hacking, slacking, chopping, uh, taking off online. We got it there. Eleven years worth of material, documentaries, books. Again, if you get the DVDs, we don't copyright on purpose so that you can make a billion copies. We don't care. Let's get God's truth out in the gospel in these last days. Amen. Amen. You can also download the Billicron app uh, for your mobile device or on, we're on Roku or Amazon Fire Stick if you want to watch on TV. So like and share, get God's word out there uh, as much as we can. We're going to have an offering this morning. And uh, if you'd like to partake in that, you're more than welcome to do so. You can just pop it in one of the two offering boxes as we exit. And, uh, but also if you would like to uh, uh, do that online, you can, you can do so. You can go to the appropriate website. You can click donate or give there or look for the mailing address. You can mail it in that way. Or even now there should be a, a number appearing on the screen and that would be your texting option. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you that you do accept us for who we are, where we are, for who we are, and, and not expecting us to quote, clean up our act before you save us. We thank you for that wonderful truth. But we thank you. You also love us enough that you don't keep us there. And you move us even closer in our walk with you in a process of maturity before we get to see you one day face to face. And we pray that that would be our trajectory. 
that we would continue to grow as your people and be those disciples, those disciplined learners in your truth. We thank you before we get to see you, we have the privilege to seek you and share you and give of our time, our tongue, our talents, but also our treasure. And we pray if we give today, we do so biblically. You tell us not to give under compulsion, which means feeling like we have to or feel guilty about it, not at all. Just as we freely give our time, our tongues, our talents, so it is with our treasure. We just, we want to. Would you please cause us to be those cheerful givers? And would you please bless this offering, God, if we so give, that you be blessed and, and glorified in it, and that we, your church, should be built up strong, have whatever resources we need to, to grow and mature in you. And that, God, that it would work towards lost souls, being one for you here in Las Vegas and around the world with what time we have left. And, God, now as we turn to your word, please bless that as well. Give us those ears to hear, hearts to obey what you would share with us, specifically what you said would happen in the last days 2,600 years ago. And now it's in the headlines. God, you don't tell us the day nor the hour of the rapture because we, unfortunately, probably goof off. But you give us signs that it's getting close, and this is another one of those signs. So help us not to miss it and miss the point of why you tell us future events. It's not to scare us. It's to motivate us to get rid of any procrastination, to not dig our heels in so deep into this world that we lose focus. We're on a giant rescue mission. We need to get the gospel out as fast as we can. Because one day, very soon, you're going to come and get us. And may you find us faithful. And God, as always, if there's anybody here that's not truly born again, I don't know the heart, but you do. And if they're not truly saved, please save them today. By your spirit, through your word, rescue them, God. May they not be under your wrath. We ask and pray your blessings upon our study. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. I don't know. You guys, how many of you guys would consider yourself a discerning Christian? Praise God out for you. You guys are already nervous. I haven't even got started yet, right? Uh, but I, have you guys noticed? I can't believe it. Just like that, COVID went away. It's just like, what happened to that, man? It just disappeared even faster than the flu did a couple years ago when they started shoving that narrative down his throat, okay? But, uh, and, and then now what's the same media? What's the same narrative? <gasps> Russia, 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 Ukraine, Ukraine, World War III, you're going to die, you're going to die. Right? Now, here's my point in bringing that up, okay? Uh, if you think that the same lying, lamestream media is all of a sudden, just like that, turning over a new leaf and sharing nothing but the truth, then please raise your hand if you believe that and then slap yourself, okay? Because uh, <laughs> there's no way, folks. Come on, man. These guys are telling lie after lie after lie, and I'm telling you it's the same thing when it comes to this Russia, Russia, Ukraine, Ukraine, okay? Now, again, just look at their track record. They lied to us about Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Vietnam, North Korea, Iran, Venezuela, Guatemala, Honduras, Haiti, Cuba, Panama, and Nicaragua, but hey, they're telling the truth about Ukraine. Yeah, whatever. Again, slap yourself if you believe that. Uh, in love, of course. But, uh, but anyway, again, but I'm telling you, it's not just they're lying. You need to pay attention. Did they have another agenda? Was it a smokescreen for a bigger global plan? I'm telling you, it's the same thing, folks. Don't fall for the lie. And I'm going to bring out just some of those aspects, okay? While everybody's focused on Russia, Russia, Ukraine, you're going to die. We're watching. Ah! Here's what they're not doing. Right now, it's all coming out, folks. The jabs are a big joke, right? And so what do you do? You admit that they don't work, or do you start a war? To squirrel, look over here, right? And if you don't think that's true, it's all starting to come out, folks. Right now, uh, the Pfizer, remember the Pfizer documents? Remember they wanted, they didn't want to release the data until 2097? That's a little suspicious, right? Okay, of what was really going on and uh, the harmful effects of these things. Uh, well, guess what? Praise God, the court order says, no, you release them now. And what they're finding, sure enough, this is not good, folks. It is mass murder of people across the planet. Amen. Just in the UK right now, 9 out of 10 of people that are dying, it's from the jabs, okay, is what's going on, the reality, okay? And, and again, that's what they're doing. They're using the Russia-Ukraine war to not discuss the elephant in the room that is growing by the day, right? Don't look over here, right? No, no, no look over here, right? And for those of you adventurous, it's the old Indiana Jones trick, right? <laughs> You just kind of, you got to be careful about it. And you got to be quick. Just swap it out there. And nobody will know. Nobody will know. Now, it's not just that. Because there's a multitude of reasons why they're pushing this latest narrative. It's also so that we'll be distracted. Because did you realize while this was going on, Biden extended the national emergency powers? Uh-oh. Why would you need that if this is supposed to be over? 
That's a little fishy, but don't, 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 Russia, 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 <laughs> right? The other thing that's going on is uh, the World Health Organization is building a global vaccine passport system. Wait a second. What? Well, good thing it's not, and that's the other thing we're distracted. As all this is going on, right now in the United States of America, they're rolling out vaccine passports here in the U.S. It's like somebody tricked us to look the wrong way. Right? But that's not all. Not only is the COVID narrative, the Great Reset agenda still marching forward as we're distracted, the election, after two years finally, now it's coming out. These guys lied through their teeth, and it's coming out. Mark Zuckerberg right now is in huge, big trouble. Millions of dollars, they're saying, he is now guilty of bribery. And this is all going on. But no, no, Russia, 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 right? Not only that, is they're saying it's getting so apparent in multitude of states, they're now starting to bring criminal charges. This is not a conspiracy theory anymore. But again, don't think about that. Ukraine, World War III, oh! right? And not only that, watch this, folks. The Durham report, nobody's talking about that. But that exposed Clinton, Obama, and the Biden crime family was guilty on purpose of spying on before and after a sitting president, which is treason. It's all coming out. But hey, no, Russia, Ukraine. But... So that's another reason why they're doing that. Okay, and then on top of that, you actually got people in Congress that is calling for the assassination of Putin. Yeah, that's going to help things out. And this is on record right there in the middle. What's he say? This is from Lindsey Graham. The only way this ends is for somebody in Russia to take this guy out. Are you stupid? What are, you, are you trying to start a war? Yes, because that also is what's needed for the next step of the Great Reset, right? As this guy says, Klaus Schwab, the Great Reset needs war, right? Well, why? Because this has been all part of the plan, folks. They need to start a global war because COVID got you, you know, close to your goal, right? It, and what's the goal? To decimate the global economy so you have the excuse to reset it with a electronic economy that they take control of, right? Well, COVID's doing a pretty good job of that, but it's not enough. So what do you need? You need the second one. A global war. Has anybody noticed any effects because of Ukraine on the economy, including gas prices? And they're saying what's coming with the food shortages and the wheat supply and all this and the supply chain even worse and worse. Why do you think it's happening? Right? Because it's going to lead ultimately towards their goal. But while this is going on, okay, what I want to focus on is another thing that they're uh, hiding and Ukraine, you and I may not be familiar with that area, but geographically, historically, that has been an area where a lot of these elites' criminal behavior has been going on. But don't think about that. Don't, don't you know, rush, rule, you're dying. Because right now, folks, it's coming out. Ukraine is the country where Obama, Biden, Soros, Schiff, Bolton, Pelosi, Kerry, Romney, and the Clinton family have been doing their illegal transfer of funds. Ukraine was the country that they were doing that. So I don't know if you start a war there, then you can start blowing up evidence. Have you seen the videos of people burning piles of piles of paper? I wonder what that's all about. Okay. Uh, as one guy says this, uh, see if you guys can get the right answer on this question. Which nationality are the main donors of the Clinton Foundation? Ukrainian, 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 or Ukrainian? I hope you get the right answer. Right Now, if you think that's uh, uh, interesting, we're all told to support the president of Ukraine. Do your research, folks. He was a trainee of the World Economic Forum from Klaus Schwab and the gang, just like Justin Trudeau. The same camp, the same trainee, he's a part of it, of this great reset, new world order. What do you want to call it? The Antichrist kingdom, the Bible calls it. Okay, uh, and then if you don't think that's more blunt, pay attention. This is a, a shot. Ukrainian parliament member tells Fox News, quote, we not only fight for Ukraine, we fight for this what? New world order. I watched the tape myself. That's a direct quote. And we're supposed to support them and Russia's the bad guy and all this. Sounds like we're being fooled again, folks. Okay, and again, I'm not saying Russia's innocent. They got their own agenda and stuff. But here's what I want to focus on. While the Ukraine invasion was going on, it just so happens of all things to say to Israel, as you're invading Ukraine, Putin makes this statement, quote, the Golan Heights, Israel, does not belong to you. Now, I don't trust the lamestream media uh, with a 10-foot pole. I don't think you should either, right? Amen. But this statement here leads me to back to the one source that you can trust, and it rhymes with the Bible. As uh, Marty McFly's cohort said, I highly recommend, okay, that you read it. 
Because when you read the Bible, you're going to see that that's not a statement by chance. The Golan Heights doesn't belong to Israel. you got a major power, a world leader from the north saying, that doesn't belong to you. And what are you trying to say? You're going to invade there next? And believe it or not, this is the sure word that you can trust. The Bible's clear. I don't know when, but it's all lining up. It's getting close. One thing that you can trust, not the media, you can trust the Bible, it's leading to this event. Russia, Israel, and the coming Gog and Magog war. Prophesied 2,600 years ago, I'm convinced we're watching it come together before our very eyes. But don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God's. Let's read that prophecy, Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38, uh, page 1398 in my Bible. That speeds it up for you. But Ezekiel 38, let's go ahead and stand as we read God's holy word. This prophecy written nearly 2,600 years ago, specifically about what's going to happen when Israel finally gets back to the land. Unfortunately, somebody's going to come and do something. Let's see if we can decipher who that is. But the classic Gog and Magog war, and let's take a look. Uh, verse 1 there in Ezekiel 38 says this, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Set your face against Gog in the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and put what? Hooks in your jaws and bring you out with your whole army. Your what? Horses. Your horsemen fully armed. And your great horde with large and small shields. All of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Cush, and Put will be with them. And all with shields and helmets. Also Gomer with all its troops. And Beth de Gorma. From the far north with all its troops. The many nations with you. Get ready. Be prepared. You and all the hordes gathered about uh, uh, with you and, and take command of them. After many days, you will be uh, called to what? Arms. And in what future years, you will invade a land that has recovered from war. Okay, as it says there, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which has long been desolate. They had been brought out from the nations, and now all of them live in safety. You and your troops and the many nations with you will go up, advancing like a storm. You'll be like a cloud covering the land. Well, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. On that day, thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil scheme. And you will say, hmm, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and without gates and bars. I will what? Plunder and loot and turn my hand against the resettled ruins and the people gathered from the nations, uh, rich in livestock and goods, living at the center of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages will say to you, have you come to what? Plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot and carry off silver and gold and take away livestock and goods and to seize much plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, this is what the sovereign Lord says in that day when my people Israel are living in safety. Will you not take notice of it? And you will come from your place in the where? Far north, you and the many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. You will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land. And in the days to come, O Gog, I will bring you out against my land so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Are you not the one I spoke of in former days by my servant, the prophets of Israel? At that time, they prophesied for years that I would bring you against Against them. This is what will happen in that day when Gog attacks the land of Israel. My what? Hot and a anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord. You may be seated if you can. Okay? But if you're not familiar with this, folks, basically the big lesson is don't mess with Israel. God is not done with her, as we saw before. Okay? And he's got a plan for them. He still needs to fulfill the Davidic uh, uh, covenant promises that one from the lineage of David would rule and reign over the whole planet. Obviously, that's not happening right now, so it's a future event. But of course, that will happen when Jesus Christ comes back with us, the church, Revelation 19, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, and establishes the millennial kingdom. But he has a remnant of Israel that he will save one-third of them during the seven-year tribulation, which is one of the reasons why Israel is a major player during that time frame, not the church. But this is the famous passage from Ezekiel dealing with the last days Gog and Magog prophecy. Now, it's here in 38, kind of talks about the invasion, 39, we'll get to in a second, talks about the decimation because these people learn the hard way that, again, you shouldn't try to mess with Israel. But it says there, you got some power that's coming from the north, right, with this ruler from the north. And then you got many nations gathered together working with them, and they're coming down 
to not just invade Israel, but it says specifically they're going to loot, they're going to plunder, and it doesn't just say a little bit, it says great plunder. Now, the first step in understanding how close we are to this prophecy from 2,600 years ago is you got to do your homework, right? Because the nations that are mentioned here are not the same title, okay? They're still there, but it's not the same title that we have on our maps today, right? And that's easy because how many guys spent your last uh, vacation in Beth de Gorma? I mean, it was Ron, the free cheese that they offered there was brilliant. I can't wait to get back. Right? How many guys uh, you know, would, uh, went to uh, Cush or Meshach and Tabal or, or Gomer? Right? They just pile things up at that place. They just. Oh, it, it doesn't get any better than that, so just work with me. Right? Or how many guys went to Put? Now, that place, you've got to be careful because once you get there, you stay put. <laughs> uh, yeah, at least that was better than Gomer pile. But, uh, but no, seriously, so, so you've got to do your homework, right? Because we don't call them that by it, but they're still there. Now, let me translate it for you. Based on the geography, the nations today mentioned this prophecy 2,600 years ago. Magog is Russia. Gog is not a place. It's a personage. It's basically the leader okay, of that area, Russia. If it were to be the ones who are in place today, it would be Putin. right? Then we have Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Tugomer, which is Turkey. Then we got Iran, somewhat at Afghanistan, Pakistan, which is Persia. Then we got Sudan, someone at Ethiopia, Somalia, or Cush, and then put is Libya. So let's throw this all together. The Bible predicted some 2,600 years ago that in the last days after Israel came back to the land, which good thing that's never happened, yeah, 1948, right, and become established again, right, then all of a sudden you would see Russia, Turkey, Iran, Sudan, Libya, and some other nations, basically the Muslim nations surrounding Israel right now, would develop an evil scheme. They would actually work together with this power from the north, Russia, to try to take out Israel. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad there's zero signs of that happening. <laughs> Turn on your news, man. What do you think is going on right now? Right? And it says there, the Bible says, here's why they do it. Okay, It wasn't just for plunder. It was much plunder. They devise this evil scheme. They get the thought in their head that, aha, now's the time. we got to work together. We're going to go down there, and we're going to rob them of their resources. And again, the Bible says, if you read not just 38, 39, it tells you how it's going to turn out. Okay, turn to somebody and say, dumb thing to do. Because man, God is, just like he said, he's going to show himself strong and mighty, and these countries are going to be decimated, right? Ezekiel 39, okay, tells us the aftermath, and says this, after that, after they invade on the mountains of where? Israel, you will fall. You and all your troops and the nations with you. I'll give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals. You will fall in the open field, for I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in safety in the coastlands, and, and they will know that I am the Lord. It is coming. It will surely take place, declares the sovereign Lord. This is the day I have spoken of. Then those who live in the towns of Israel will go out and use the weapons for fuel and burn them up, the small and large shields, the bows, the arrows, the war clubs and spears. For how long? For seven years, they will use them for fuel. They will not need to gather wood from the fields or cut it from the forest because they will use the weapons for fuel. And they will plunder those who plundered them. They'll loot those who looted them, declares the sovereign Lord, son of man. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Call out to every kind of bird and all the wild animals, assemble and come together from all around to the sacrifice I am preparing for you. It's a bloodbath. The great sacrifice on the mountains of where? Israel, there you will eat flesh and drink blood. I will display my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see the punishment I inflict on the, in the hand I lay upon them. From that day forward, the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God. Amen. And so again, the question is, do we see any signs of these powers from the north, Russia, you know, a, a Gog-like person, leader from there, like a Putin uh, working together with specifically these nations mentioned here, the Muslim nations surrounding Israel to, 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 to try to invade one day and take her out? Is there any signs of devising an evil scheme? Is there any, is there any bait there? Is there any hook in the jaw, as God calls it, that is enough to bring them down and do the unthinkable and start a war in the Middle East? Yeah, it's everywhere. Okay, and I'm going to share with you why Israel is such a hotly contested piece of real estate. There's at least four different reasons that I see, and all of them, I believe, are adding to the hook as to why Russia would do the unthinkable. 
not just in Ukraine, not just Syria, but keep on coming down. Russia right now, by the way, for years, folks, who do you think has been the one who's been arming these Muslim nations against Israel with weaponry? Russia. U.S. and Russia are the biggest global uh, suppliers of weaponry on the planet. Russia, their biggest customers, is down that area. So they're armed to the teeth with who? It just happens to be a power from the north, right? Okay, but again, do we see any signs of them devising a scheme to like, you know what? We better go down there and loot them, plunder them, take control. Yeah, and the first reason why is the landmass. Just Israel was placed uh, in the first place, okay? It's not by chance that God called uh, Abram later to change his name to Abraham, which is where the Jewish people came from. Remember, he called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And the reason why it was called Ur of the Chaldees, because it's the Fertile Crescent. So he went over here, and he went around that corner. And we all know when you take a corner, what do you say? No, that's not what it is. Listen, you want me to go back to Gomer? I'll go back to Gomer if you guys don't work with me. No. So <laughs> it's not by chance that God called him out of the earth of the Chaldees, the fertile Christ, and he comes down, and of all places, it's right this spot. No, God knew exactly what he's doing. Let's remind ourselves of who that land belongs to and where it's at. But this is what we see in the Genesis account. Right, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 5. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country and your people and your father's household and go to the what? The land I will show you. Right? I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. I wonder how that's going to happen. Well, who came from the Jewish people? Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Right? Exactly. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all the possessions they had accumulated, okay, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land in Canaan, and they arrived there. Okay? And I'm sure it was just some random thing that God was going, oh, go here. You know, no, but think about it. why did God send him? exactly there. Why is that the place for the Jewish people? Why of all places didn't he say, hey, head towards Asia or, or, or Asia or, or go, no, no, go north and, and you know, so you can counteract uh, this uh, Magog thing in the future. No, no, hey, slip on down, go through Africa. There's a lot of land there. You guys won't have any problems. Why did God say this spot? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of different reasons why. And uh, when you take a look at the location of Israel, that is one of the most historically contested piece of real estate still to this day. Uh, especially if your plans are global domination, right? But let's take a look at that, right? Israel just happens to be a tiny little strip of land that connects three continents, right? If, you want, if you're in Europe and you want to go to Africa, where do you got to go through? You got to go through Israel. If you're in Asia and you want to go to Africa, you got to go through Israel. And reverse it. If you're in Africa, you want to go to Europe or you want to go to Asia, where do you got to go? Three continents are connected right there. And that's why it's a strategic place for a lot of people who want to own that little strip of land. It's very important. Now, part of it is because eventually uh, that's where the Messiah would come from. It bless all nations. So there, I believe, a missionary aspect. The Old Testament says that the Jewish people were to be a light unto the Gentiles, right? And then eventually, uh, here comes Jesus. And then if you do the research, uh, when the uh, gospel comes forth in the New Testament, okay, then of all places for that good news, which is where the gospel means, that Jew and Gentile can be saved, that guess what? You're there at what? At a, a point where pew, you can begin to spread that message across the world, right? It's not by chance. So if, if you will, it's a great strategic spot for missions when you're finally getting the truth out to be a light unto this world, and certainly that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, then that's a very strategic location, right? And, and did you know that was before internet was born, right? <laughs> they had to do these crazy low, they didn't have phones. Can you, how they live, Right? And so it was just on foot and travel and wrote it down, low-tech stuff, right? But that's what you needed to quickly disseminate, right? But there's another reason why, and historically, this has been a strategic area of land for people who want to invade other countries, who plan on taking over the world, okay, as well as control the trade route. So there's an economic reason as well. And this is what you see throughout the history, even biblical history. Why is it you read so much about Israel when it talks about the Assyrian Empire, or the Babylonian Empire, or even the Persian Empire, or Alexander the Great and what he did uh, in the Macedonian Empire. Well, because they wanted to take over the world in order to do that, what? You have to get control, and you have to go through this area of Israel, right? Even uh, in New Testament times, the Roman Empire, 
right? That was the area you got to have control of because, again, it connects the three continents. And if you want to control the trade, grab control of major sources of money, right? Because you could do tariffs and taxes and all that stuff, right? Uh, but also, if you want to invade, you got to go through there. So that's one of the reasons why. In fact, if you look at Ezekiel, he basically tells God, I'm not just planting you there. He specifically says, I'm putting you in the, quote, center of the nations, right? And this is what we see here, Ezekiel 5.5. 5. This is what the sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I've set in the, what? Center of the nations with countries all around her, okay? In other words, it's a strategic landmass, and that's why, not just in the past, but even today, it's such a hotly contested piece of real estate. If you've ever wondered, why is it these guys never get along? Why is there always trouble in Israel? Well, one God prophesied that would happen, okay, that uh, Israel would be a cup of trembling for the nations. That's another prophecy, okay? But again, it's this issue. When you control this area, okay, you need that if you're a, basically a mega maniac and you want to control the world. But let's take a look at this video. Founded in 1948, the State of Israel is located on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. The country borders the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. Israel's territory has historically been a magnet for great powers, from the Romans to the British. For a Mediterranean power, Israel can serve as a strategic land bridge. And for an eastern power, control of Israel is necessary to secure its flank. Israel contains parts of four distinct topographical regions. The Negev is an extension of the Sinai Desert and accounts for more than half of Israel. The coastal plain begins in the Gaza Strip and extends northwards to the border with Lebanon. The hill region extends from the foothills of Mount Hermon in the north to south of Jerusalem. The Jordan Rift Valley follows the length of the Jordan River and continues down to the Red Sea. Israel also claims the western two-thirds of the Golan Heights, a strategic plateau. The country's core is in the coastal plain and the hill region. Over 3 million of Israel's approximately 8 million inhabitants live in Gush Dan, or the greater Tel Aviv area. Israel currently has the ability to defend itself, but must maintain a posture of constant military readiness. I wonder why. Well, they know more than we because they live there. Okay, it's a strategic landmass that historically, even to this day, people want it. And that's why they have to have such a huge military, is to defend themselves from a constant daily threat of invasion. So many people say well, that, that could be part of the, the hook of the jaw, one of the hooks that's going to seduce Russia to come down from the north. But there's also some other ones. And again, these are recent discoveries. I think another big one is Israel's recent discoveries of gas and oil. Okay, uh, Is any of that in the news? Is any gas prices going through the roof and... Maybe it's just enough to shove somebody over the edge, say, I, we got to get a new supply or, or, or stop threatening our supply. Or, yeah, exactly. That's what's going on. But it just so happens that Israel happens to be in the heart of the world's oil and gas reserves. It's a strategic significance because uh, it just so happens. Now, think about God's sovereignty, right? He calls Abram, later Abraham, the Ur of the Chaldees, and he plops him right there. And for, since Israel's come back to land, that used to be the joke. It's like, man, how come all these other Muslim nations, the Saudis and all these other guys, the Iraqis, they get tons of oil, and we ain't got nothing until now, right? God knew exactly what he was doing, okay? Uh, and not only that, it's of all things for them to find there, it's what? Gas and oil for a what? A future time when God knew that mankind would develop a transportation system that is completely dependent upon gas and oil. That's not by chance. God knew, obviously, that for a future time, dare I say in the last days, that this is going to become an extremely valuable global commodity. Uh, in fact, Israel is now went from we are dependent on other countries for gas and oil. They are quickly becoming energy independent and becoming a major exporter that threatens, guess whose economy? Russia, right? Here's just one gas field. It's called the Leviathan. Watch this. Israel is located in a region that is extremely rich in oil and gas, but it has practically none of its own. Until recently, offshore discoveries could make the country self-sufficient in energy. Elliot Gottken reports. The Middle East produces around a third of the world's oil and about 15% of its gas, but almost none of it comes from Israel. But on the eastern edge of the Med, that's changing, and here's why. 
Named after the biblical sea monster, Leviathan is a monster gas field, at the time the biggest discovery in a decade. It contains 20 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, perhaps enough to power Israel for more than 100 years. US-based Noble Energy, together with its main local partner, Delek Drilling, stand to make billions. So it's a big deal, not only for ourselves, as a commercial company, uh, which uh, for sure is a game changer, but I think that the implications are very uh, significant also to the Israeli economy and for the state of Israel in large. Now Israel could export the gas to Asia, it could export it to Europe, reducing these regions' dependence on Russia and boosting its own diplomatic muscle in the process. What? Did you catch that? It's so much. Uh, and this is just one field. Uh, they've got other ones called Tamar, Delete, and Dolphin. They, they, they're, got, they're sitting on buku gas. The more they drill, the more they find. And what it say? They're not only going to become energy independent. Now we can become a major exporter to who? Through the UK, who currently is being supplied by guess who? Russia. And I'm sure that they'll just sit there and let that destroy their economy. <laughs> And I quote, President Vladimir Putin contacted Israel's prime minister and made an offer he believed he couldn't refuse. Putin offered to guarantee the safety of Israel's newly discovered Leviathan gas fields using the full might of the Russian military. <laughs> quote, Israel's prime minister declined. But then Putin sends fighter jets, tanks, sophisticated battlefield communications equipment, special forces in Syria, which again is at the top of Israel. Right? Russia's also deployed anti-aircraft missiles and all kinds of things. Who's this for? Right? The ISIS and the, those guys, they don't have an air force. It's obviously to, quote, detour Israel in case they would desire uh, to retaliate. This impressive, impressive Russian arsenal is fully augmented by the ominous presence of a Russia nuclear submarine off of Syria's coast in the Mediterranean. Right? And this provides Russia with the ultimate deterrence if, again, Israel would want to detour Russia's invasion in that area, okay? And he says this, Russia's aims are obvious, resources, okay? This is the real access, this area, uh, through uh, Syria. Of course, Ukraine gives them another route, but you're looking at them not just coming down, but they're coming down that could lead to a trail to where? Uh, to Israel. And he says this, this Russian objective relates to Israel and the, quote, hook that God himself will place in Gog's jaw. At some point, Gog will have an evil thought and will determine to invade a beautiful land to, quote, take a spoil. Okay, this is legitimately within Russia's grasp. And he says, we are living in days of awe and blessed to see what we see today. We are witnessing a real-time buildup of the horde that will seek to vanquish Israel as described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Okay, we are privileged to see these events in real time. The horde is forming now. And the alliances mentioned there uh, are coming to pass. Russia and Iran are already very close. Turkey's become an ally with Iran because they both hate Israel. The president of Turkey openly despises Israel, a vicious hater of Israel. And then there's little Israel sitting all alone in the Middle East. Little Israel sitting on an oil field of immense size and almost incalculable, valuable, and, and, and little Israel hated and scorned by all the nations of the world, openly despised, seemingly without a, a true friend or a real protector, especially the current administration here. Little Israel, isolated, alone, very exposed, or so Gog thinks. God himself on that day will stand up and fight for her on her behalf, and woe to Gog and his allies, for mighty is the Lord who will save her. Blessed be the Lord God who has revealed these things to his servants. He has not left us alone, but revealed to us what is shortly to come to pass. Though the world will look on these things in days to come with fear and dread, we should not Christian because we know the beginning of the end. It just means Israel is rapidly approaching her appointment and destiny, and so are we. It's getting close. All right. But that's just the gas. Okay. That's going on there that people think, hey, that's, that's, you know, and again, that's Russia. That's their big economy. Okay. Uh, and you think they're just going to say, yep, destroy our economy. No way. No way. Something. So that's a valuable piece of real estate, period. But the gas, now to add that, it's also oil. They're not just gas. Israel is now, they found out, they thought they were there for no reason. Everybody else gets all the oil but us. They are making some of the biggest discoveries, and guess where one of the biggest discoveries is? The Golan Heights. Take a look at that.
Recently discovered oil reserves in the eastern Mediterranean look set to become the latest point of tension in the troubled region. At least four major competitors are staking their claim. Israel, Lebanon, Turkey and Cyprus all want a peace, but with no clearly defined maritime borders. The fight could be lengthy, bitter and even bloody. Artis Paulus Lear takes a closer look. Prayers a long time in coming. I've been begging for a year, a year. Please, Lord, don't let me down. Don't let me down. And finally, Jackie Malaysia's prayers have been answered. The oil company he's invested in reportedly hitting bingo underground. We're still talking about the largest amount of oil ever to be discovered in the state of Israel. But it's not only Israel laying claim to the reserves. Greek Cyprus, Turkey and Lebanon also say the oil's theirs. And while international law allows a country to drill in the so-called continental shelf off its coast, the fact that Israel and Lebanon have never agreed on maritime boundaries makes it unclear where Israel ends and Lebanon begins. I know that Lebanon has its version of where it thinks the borderline will pass if and when they, we ever negotiate. And I know that Israel has its own version of where the line passes, but they're not in agreement on where that line is. And because the two countries are enemy states, there's unlikely to be any agreement anytime soon. There's a joke in Israel that when Moses led the Jews out of Egypt, he took a wrong turn on his way to the promised land, bringing them to the one spot in the Middle East that has no oil. But that punchline might need to change because it seems that Moses might not have been so wrong after all. And again, this is a recent discovery. Even when Israel came back to the land in 1948, they thought they were just sitting on desert, making the most of it. And then you put together God's sovereignty, again, back to Genesis 12, of all places for Abram to land, and here's the land. It's a land that now we know is full of gas and oil, which is determinant on... They didn't, they didn't drive down there with cars and a U-Haul, right? Lot had a lot of stuff, by the way. They could have used one, but, but no... It, it, but in, although some would say that the New Testament, the apostles, they drove Hondas because the Bible says they were all in one accord. <laughs> I had to throw that in because I'm still reeling from Gomer. And Gomer, Gomer says, but, but you got to risk in ministry. It's all about risk. It's all about risk. But, but again, think about God's sovereignty, right? And then it just so happens in the days we live in with modern technology, that's how we get around and the whole world's dependent upon it, and they're sitting on a pile. But specifically, it's also mentioned the Golan Heights. Okay, uh, One guy says this, the discovery made in uh, the Golan Heights uh, is one of the biggest billions and billions of barrels of oil discovered in recently. And the government uh, of Israel, of course, considers the Golan Heights to be a part of their territory. The UN, shocker, does not uh, recognize Israel's sovereignty over that. They want it to be uh, Syria. And now massive amounts of oils are going to be there. And they're saying this is going to set another stage for World War III, right? Because why? Because do you think that Syria and the Muslim neighbors are just going to sit there and let Israel, quote, pump their oil out of the ground? No, right? And then do you think Russia is going to sit up there and let them pump that oil out of the ground so much so that they export it and then it's going to destroy their economy? Do you see how they could start working together in a partnership for the same evil thought that might pop in their head? We better take these guys out, right? And it goes on and says this, just as Israel's offshore Mediterranean gas discoveries have created an entire energy industry, so the Golan Heights oil could also generate a new industry around it as well, okay? And it's a motivation that many people believe that they're going to want to grab that area, okay, and launch a war to get it. Depending on the size of the oil field under uh, the Golan Heights, the whole uh, configuration of oil country and control in the Middle East is going to be effective. Listen, who has it, who owns it, who sells it, who buys it, and who sets the price, right? And this is why, uh, if you're not familiar, believe it or not, what's going on right now with the invasion of Ukraine, one of the effects of that is it's jacking up the what? Oil prices. That benefits Russia, right? So they're gaining out of this uh, as well, Okay. And the more it goes up. But if, if Israel starts to export, then it's going to drive the prices back down because now we've got a new supply and you can see where it's headed. Right? 
And that's what people think. Uh, even the Russian Times uh, said about this discovery in the Golan Heist, uh, it has the potential to produce billions of barrels. We're talking about significant qualities. Quote, everybody and his brother wants a piece of that pie. Quote, as usual, war is a strategy for getting it. So that's why a lot of people are saying, could this be a hook that's going to be, you know what? I'm going to do the unthinkable. Gog from Magog. I'm going to work with these Muslim nations. And we're, we're going to go down there and grab control. We're going to do the unthinkable. Who would on purpose start World War III? You could see. Okay, with that as well. Okay, but one guy says this. It appears the prophetic scenario of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is beginning to take shape in Russia. Quote, oil is something the entire world depends on. That certainly qualifies as, quote, plunder. Interesting. And again, as he's invading Ukraine, of all things for him to say, he says the what? The Golan Heights do not belong to you. He's up in Ukraine. Why is he making that? Unless you have plans to keep going. Where were heard that before? Ezekiel 38. Let me give you another resource. The third one is water, right? Water is a huge, huge resource in this area, and it just so happens that Israel's got a ton of it. Now, as we saw before in our Jewish people in the Antichrist study, in fulfillment of another prophecy, that Israel would blossom as a rose in the desert. They're basically the breadbasket now of the Middle East uh, because they are masters of water conservation. When they first went to Israel, obviously a desert, much like uh, Vegas, uh, but they didn't have much water. And what water they did have was disease, infected, swamp-like, mosquitoes, malaria. They were dealing with all that. But they didn't just sit around. They built canals and reservoirs and, and, and uh, plants and all kinds of stuff and piping system to be smart with what water they do have. And then they became the world's leading expert in the technology called desalination plants. And so much so, because you, know, you look at Israel, they're backed up against the Mediterranean Sea there. They can take salt water with the desalination plant and produce fresh water. In fact, they're the ones that other countries who are wanting to do the same are getting the information from. Israel's a leading global expert on that. But so much so, it's not just working for them, that Israel right now, listen, produces 20% 20, 20 more water than it consumes. So now other Nate, do you see how, and that's a huge thing, right? Okay. Uh, and so again, other people saying on top of the land area, the strategic location, on top of the gas, on top of the oil, they got so much water that that whole area needs that it could start another war. It could be another hook in the jaw. Watch this. Water is life, so they say, but rivalry over supplies can lead to bitter conflicts. You can see here that since the mid-20th century, the planet's seen nearly 180 conflicts connected to water resources. These include both small and large-scale clashes, a lot of them in the Mideast and Africa. Well, you might be surprised to hear that it's water rather than oil there that could be what's fought over in the coming years. Paulus Lear reports now from Israel. The Bible tells us that within a short distance from here, Jesus turned water into wine. 2,000 years later, the greater miracle might be turning the wine back into water. The problem is, in some places, there's very little water to go around. When you have a common uh, water resource shared by several sovereign nations, there's always a possibility of clash of interests. Conflicts that should be manageable will spin out of control. And examples of possible conflicts are plentiful. Syria's major water sources travel through Turkey and Iraq, making it vulnerable. While Jordan is reliant on a river where Syria built a dam. Egypt also recently expressed concern over countries using the Upper Nile to generate electric power. In the dry landscape of the Middle East, water is a prize more precious than diamonds. In its absence, famine and drought are quick to follow. But this is a region that very seldom needs an excuse for war. And water shortages might just tip the balance. For what? Might be enough to add to the other two? It's worth going down there and basically starting World War III, invading the Middle East, doing the unthinkable, right? So water is another reason why. Okay, and let me give you one more, uh, and that's Israel's minerals. And now typically, this one gets, uh, in my opinion, overlooked, okay? Uh, Israel not only has great resources just being where it's at, location with the landmass, not just with oil, not just with gas, and not even just water, as we just saw. But Israel is sitting on the biggest mineral deposit on the planet. Now, it's called the Dead Sea. The problem is the Dead Sea is not dead at all. 
that is one of the most valuable pieces of real estate anywhere on the earth. Okay. In fact, some companies now are based out of the Dead Sea, uh, and they're getting very rich off of it. Here's just one of them. It's called Ahava. Uh, but did you catch at the very beginning of that? This isn't just about wow, look, that's amazing. They can make makeup and skincare products. Well, they're getting very rich off of that. Okay, and th they are using those minerals. But what did it say at the beginning of the video? If you're paying attention, it is the Dead Sea quote is the richest source of minerals in the world. Now, when you take a look at what else is going on there besides makeup and skin cream, the minerals that are in there, oh, it, it could be a huge hook in the jaw that you can't even believe to add to the other ones. Watch this. God dug a tremendous hole in the earth many years ago to store a treasure for his people, which staggers the imagination, and that's the Dead Sea. God arranged things that, so that the Jordan River and its tributaries have been washing minerals down into that hole that God prepared for thousands of years. And in recent years, it's been found to be, listen, the most valuable depository of strategic chemicals in the world. It is estimated that the potential value of potash, bromine, and other chemical salts of its water, listen, just that is four times the wealth of the United States. And any would-be dictator would take high risks, okay, to capture that treasure. Uh, and not only that, it could furnish them with enough fertilizer for the whole world and with its other chemicals provide the, quote, explosives needed to subdue all its enemies. So why do you think Russia has spent billions of dollars in helping the Arabs over all these years to fight? Because they love each other? There's no love loss. And this guy goes, and I would agree, you know, only God knows the motive of, of Russia. But he says, basically, he would allow the Muslim nations to do the dirty work. And then once Israel's recaptured, that's the evil thought, then they're going to come in and take them out and take control. Right? But he says this, he says, that's what they're working on. And when the nations of the earth will be beating a path to Israel's door for these chemicals, which mean life to them, God will judge them and crush them. And yet, even now... That was warned about 2,600 years ago. The Kremlin is plotting to do that job. They're preparing an invasion force to go down over the mountains of Syria to seize Israel. Now watch this. For years, people laughed at the Ezekiel 38 prophecy that God would destroy this great army in the mountains that are in the northern part of Israel and that Israel would burn their weapons for fuel for seven years. Okay? Only recently, it's been known that the tanks and weapons of this army are made of non-metallic materials which burn like coal to thwart the Israeli metal-seeking atomic missiles. And Reuters news agency has reported that Russia uh, has made large purchases of special archery equipment so powerful and accurate that it could shoot an arrow through a man's heart at 100 yards and still keep going. And it's no secret that Russia has also bought up a large number of horses, a type best adapted for a military invasion through the mountains. And the Bible said that's exactly what's going to happen. Who would have dreamed, he says, that a literal fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecies of bows and arrows and horses with a great battle with Russia and her satellite armies is going to come over the mountains to invade Israel, but then that's when God steps in and destroys them from the sky. Christian, he says, this is no pipe dream. They are carefully authenticated facts, which fits perfectly, shocker, into Bible prophecy. So let's get busy while there's still time with tracts and personal witnessing and rescue those who are perishing and tell them their need of Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you're unsaved, listen, the day of grace is still here, but it may be gone tomorrow or even today. Repent of your sins now while you still have time because the prophesied Ezekiel 38 war is about to come to pass. It's all in the news. But you don't get it unless you're into the Bible. God told us as a sign that it's getting close. And that's why Jesus said when these things begin to take place, and it's all forming around us. Lift up your heads, man. Stand up. Get excited. Woo-hoo! Right? Your redemption draws near. We need to finish just like that guy said. Not being freaked out or afraid. We're not safe for this world. We're safe for the world to come. We're not going to the seven-year tribulation. We're safe from God's wrath through Jesus Christ. But if you have any ounce of compassion then you would tell people who are in danger of being left behind to face these horrible realities, certainly the reality of the seven-year tribulation, and tell them how to get out through Jesus now. Amen? That's how we need to finish. But again, if you're here, 
If you don't get saved, you're, you're running the, the rapture could happen today. You're running the risk of being left behind. And if you think the Ezekiel 38 war would be bad, oh, wait till the seven year tribulation starts. Okay? And, and then very shortly, a global war breaks out in, in just the first half, in the first part of the first half. And the Bible says just from that war alone, two billion people die, one fourth of the planet. You don't want to be there. You need to take the way out today through Jesus. It may look something like this. We'll close in prayer after this.
just in the first part of the first half of the seven-year tribulation, two billion people will die from a global war. And you're just getting started in the seven-year tribulation. Church, the good news is we're not going there. God has saved us. He's rescued us. He's not appointed us unto wrath because the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ died on the cross. But if we have any ounce of compassion or caring, we would not be busy goofing off, loving this world or the things of this world. We get busy telling people the good news. There's a way out. His name is Jesus. And if anything, it's really easy for us now. Look at the news. Apply it to the scripture. Don't trust the news. Look at what's going on. The Bible is the only book that is trustworthy. And these are signs that time is running out. Amen. Easy for us to witness right now. Because the world's living it with us too. And we need to tell as many as we can. But if you're here today, are you ready? This is not a joke. The wars that are coming, you don't want to be a part of this. There's a way out, and his name is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if you call upon the name of Jesus Christ, ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, believe that it was his death on the cross that is full payment for all of our sins. And the Bible says if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised you from the grave, you'll be saved. He's willing to save you no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've gone. That's how powerful his love and forgiveness is. But if you don't want it, then you made your choice. Don't make the wrong choice. Receive his love and grace and forgiveness today before it's too late.